It's our privilege this morning to share around the Lord's table and remember afresh the sacrifice of our Lord and Saviour. I'd like to read from the first six verses of John chapter 14. And our reading, although it begins at the start of a chapter, really begins mid-story. Here we have Jesus comforting his disciples. But in order for us to understand why they needed comforting, we really need to understand what had happened previously. In chapter 13, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, he would depart from this world and return to the Father. Jesus had come forth from God and was going back to God. We find Jesus in the upper room with his disciples, and in the absence of a servant, Jesus laid aside his garments and, taking a towel, poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. Here we are given a glimpse into the heart of Jesus, a servant's heart. Jesus had descended from the splendours of heaven. He had come from the very presence of God. The word had become flesh and dwelt among us. Yet Jesus humbled himself to do the job of the lowest of servants. This is the night before his crucifixion. The Passover meal is already prepared. They are about to break bread when Jesus announces that one of them is going to betray him. The disciples are stunned. You see, in the lead up to this night, Jesus had been preparing them for his departure. He had told them multiple times that he was going to be leaving them, going to a place where they could not yet follow him. The disciples are now profoundly confused. They have been with him for three years. They love him. They believe in him. But they are starting to realise that what they thought was going to happen is now uncertain. Their messianic hopes and expectations that Jesus would be crowned king and that he would rule and restore the Jewish people out from underneath the rule of the Romans were now in tatters. And as if their disappointment at the news of Jesus' departure wasn't enough, now Jesus tells them that one of them is going to betray him and that their leader is going to deny him three times. And the Gospels of Mark and Matthew also tell us that Jesus says to them, you're all going to scatter. So we come to chapter 14, verse 1. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So imagine the scene, we have the night before Jesus' crucifixion, only hours before his arrest. Jesus, being all-knowing, understood exactly what lay before him. Humility, pain, emotional turmoil. He knew the sin of the world would be laid upon him. But most of all, he understood that he would face separation from his father for the first time. Not long later, whilst praying in the garden, the anguish and the sorrow of the situation became so great that it caused the Saviour to sweat blood. Speaking to Peter and James and John, he says, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Were Jesus' disciples comforting him? Well, it would seem that they were too distressed, perhaps too confused to do so. However, Jesus found it within himself, with all that he was enduring, to comfort those closest to him. Again, we see the heart of Jesus, a heart of love and compassion. Jesus was offering them hope amongst their despair. He says to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not worry yourselves with my leaving. Only a few days earlier, Jesus rode into Jerusalem to a welcome befitting a king. And I think it's safe to say that the disciples had got caught up in this. And their hopes had now turned to despair as they contemplated the departure of their Lord. And at a time when those closest to Jesus should have surrounded him with support and love, the Saviour is forced to forgo his own needs to comfort them with his love. Isaiah 63 9 tells us, In all their distress, he too was afflicted. He says to them, You believe in God, believe also in me. He is talking to his closest friends. What's more, Jesus knew their heart. So his words here are more of a statement rather than a question. In fact, I think he was reassuring them at a point when they were questioning everything that they knew. 
everything they had seen over the previous three years. You believe in God who you cannot see, therefore believe also in me, when soon you will not see me. Jesus was declaring himself to be God, and of course we remember how the book of John starts. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Jesus' compassion led him to tell them that yes, he was going away, but it was for good reason. He was going to prepare a place for them with the Father. For in the Father's house there are many dwelling places. He reassures them by saying, if this were not so, I would have told you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back to receive you unto myself. Because there is no point in preparing a place for someone unless you intend to take them there. And this promise is as much for us today as it was for those troubled, downcast disciples in that upper room. In biblical times, it was customary for Jewish men to use a similar, if not the same, phrase as a marriage betrothal towards a prospective bride. The man, after negotiating the price of marriage with the father of the bride, would say, In my father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. And when I have prepared it, I will return for you so that you may be where I am. This is a beautiful picture, is it not, of Christ leaving his father's home in heaven? <coughs> Sorry. His father's home in heaven to come and establish a marriage covenant with his church. And in God's perfect timing, Jesus made this promise to his disciples on the very same night that he chose to teach them about the new covenant through the cup of communion, which we share in now. The shedding of his blood on the cross the following day established this new covenant. In doing this, Jesus paid the price for his church, just as the groom would have purchased his bride. After the groom had returned to his father's house and prepared for his marriage and ensured the couple's financial security, he would return again and collect his bride to take her back to his father. As the bride did not know exactly when he would return, when he did so, he would bring his bridal party and they would make lots of noise, shouting, singing, blowing horns and trumpets. This was to signal the bride that he had returned for her and that she should gather her things to go with him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 refers to the second coming of Christ by saying, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. Finally, Jesus says, You know the way where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, please say it with me. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you have your elements, if you'd like to prepare them. Jesus has declared that he is the only way to the Father. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven and earth by which we must be saved. And just as the bride had prepared herself, so should we, so that when he comes or if he calls us home before he returns, we are ready. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that you would send your son to us, leaving behind the splendours of heaven to dwell among us and to establish a marriage covenant with your church. Jesus, we take comfort in the promise that you are with the Father preparing a place for us, and that if we believe in you who we cannot see, that one day you will return and receive us to yourself so that we might be where you are. We ask your blessing upon this table now as we share in the bread and the cup, a symbol of your body broken and blood shed on our behalf. Amen. Please take the bread. Jesus purchased his bride with his own blood, poured out on the cross of Calvary. With a grateful heart, let us drink together. <clears throat> 